Dear Professor Berg, dear Professor Vogel, and dear Mrs. Schüssler, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the Staatsbibliothek. While preparing for this evening, I talked to a good friend, a personal friend, as well as a friend in professional matter. She is member to Gesine Bottomley. As some of you might know, she is a member of the board of our Freundes- und Förderkreis, the Friends of the Staatsbibliothek. But as the director of the library of the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin, she met Peter Burke. Exactly 25 years ago, during those historic days of the fall of the wall, Peter Burke was one of the fellows at the Institute for Advanced Study. His report in the yearbook of the Wissenschaftskolleg for 1989, uh, 89, confirms what Gesine Bottomley also remembers. Unlike many of the other fellows from around the world, Peter Burke did not let himself be much distracted from the, his research, even by this emotional and historic event. Robert Danton, a historian from Princeton at the time, and also much focused on books, documents, and libraries, on the other hand, decided, as he wrote, to drop everything and follow the events as closely as possible. Both Burke as well as Danton were later re responsible for the libraries of their universities. Burke at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, Danton as university librarian at Harvard. So going back exactly to uh, 25 years from now, Peter Burke was in Berlin working on not one, but two books concerned with French history. In the report for the yearbook, which I just mentioned, he wrote about his research and also mentioned the extraordinary book fetching facilities of the library of the Wissenschaftskolleg. Also on the surface, it was Frau Bottomley, together with her colleagues, who fetched the, re the requested books. But having no library holdings of their own at the Institute, it was the Staatsbibliothek they routinely turned to to fill the requests of the fellows. Dear Mr. Burke, you can therefore be certain that a substantial part of the library material you consulted 25 years ago came from the holdings of our Staatsbibliothek. In this sense, you were already among our readers a quarter of a century ago. Now I'll switch into German because I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit about your book, which is um, easier for me to do it in German. Meine Damen und Herren, Peter Burks Explosion des Wissens trifft auf ein sehr breites Medieninteresse. Peter Burks neues wissenschaftshistorisches Werk ist in den Feuilletons fast aller namhaften Blätter überwiegend sehr freundlich besprochen worden. Es handele sich, so die Frankfurter Allgemeine, um einen schwindelerregend disziplin- und epochenübergreifenden Rundumschlag. Souverän würde Burke als Koch seine Zutaten beherrschen. In Analogie zu den Worten von Claude Levi Strauss, nachdem die Information etwas noch Rohes sei, das Wissen hingegen etwas aus diesen Zutaten Verarbeitetes und schmackhaft wie auch nahrhaft Gegartes, befindet die Welt. Burks Explosion des Wissens sei kein schnödes Rührei, auch kein schlichtes Spiegelei, 
sondern ein reichhaltiges und herzhaftes Omelette. Denn Peter Berg sei ein Diskursmixer in der Tradition der klassischen Universalgelehrten und Polyhistoriker. Und die Süddeutsche Zeitung befindet gar ebenfalls unter Berufung auf Levi Strauss. Das Buch sei die großzügige Einladung zu einem Festmahl. Meine Damen und Herren, ein Buch, was sich der europäischen Wissensgeschichte seit dem ausgehenden 18. Jahrhundert widmet und sich wirklich im Grunde die moderne Wissensvermehrung zum Thema macht, kann man selbstredend überall präsentieren. Denn die Universalität des Themas macht jedweden Raum in jeder Einrichtung irgendwie geeignet. Und doch gibt es Häuser, die sich ganz ideal anbieten, um über ein Buch zu sprechen, in dem es darum geht, wie sich Wissen verbreiten kann, auch verlieren kann, wie man Wissen archivieren und popularisieren kann. Wir lernen bei Peter Berg, dass der Zugang zum Wissen nirgends so schnell, unaufwendig und preiswert war, dass sich deshalb gleichwohl kein Gefühl unendlichen Glücks einstellen mag, sondern eher eine vage Ahnung eines indifferenten Unglücklichseins, da wir von Tag zu Tag und auch berechtigter fürchten müssen, der Fülle der Daten zu erliegen, die Masse an verfügbaren Informationen gar nicht mehr bewältigen und sortieren zu, kommen, zu können, um für uns selber aus der rohen Information ein Wissen bereiten zu können. Nirgends, so möchte ich behaupten, kann das Ambiente für eine Diskussion über Peter Burks Gedanken besser sein, als in einer wissenschaftlichen Bibliothek, in einer Bibliothek zumal, die doch die Nachlässe mit ihren Originalhandschriften einer ganzen Reihe der von Burke in seinem Buch genannten Wissenschaftler und Geistesgrößen hütet. Peter Burke nennt zahlreiche Namen aus der gesamten wissenschaftlichen Welt und immer wieder begegnen uns Namen, deren Manuskripte und Korrespondenzen hier in diesem Haus verwahrt und der Forschung bereitgestellt werden. Der Ethnologe Franz Boas, der Afrikaforscher Georg Schweinfurt, Theodor Fontane und Adolf von Harnack, die Historiker Mommsen und Ranke, die Brüder Grimm, Hermann von Helmholtz und vor allem und immer wieder bei Peter Berg Alexander von Humboldt. In diesen Wochen spielen die amerikanischen Reisetagebücher Alexander von Humboldts die bedeutendste Erwerbung der Staatsbibliothek in den vergangenen Jahrzehnten eine besonders große Rolle. Jene Bedeutung, die Humboldt für diese Bibliothek besitzt, billigt Burke Humboldt ebenfalls als zweitem Entdecker Amerikas bei. Ich zitiere Burke, Seite 78. Ein berühmtes Beispiel für einen Vermessungsenthusiasten in den Naturwissenschaften zu Beginn des 19. Jahrhunderts ist Alexander von Humboldt. Auf seiner Forschungsreise durch Hispanoamerika führte er nach eigener Beschreibung über 40 Messinstrumente mit sich, unter anderem ein Altimeter zur Höhenmessung, ein Hygrometer zur Niederschlagsmessung, ein Magnetometer zur Messung des Erdmagnetismus und sogar ein Cyanometer zur Messung der Himmelspleue. In diesem Sinne, jene Explosion des Wissens, von der uns Peter Berg erzählt, fand ihren Liederschlag nicht zuletzt hier in dieser Bibliothek. Zunächst als Sammelstätte der Quellen, später als Depot all jener Untersuchungen, die aus den Forschungsergebnissen erwuchsen. Ich richte meinen Dank heute an Herrn Burg, an Herrn Vogel und an den Verlag Klaus Wagenbach gleichermaßen, dass wir über dieses Buch hier in der Staatsbibliothek diskutieren, zuhören und ich wünsche Ihnen allen einen sehr anregenden Abend. Vielen Dank. Applaus
Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Hören Sie mich? Ja, jetzt. Schlecht. Bitte melden Sie sich, wenn Sie schlecht hören. Wir hatten hier schon mal das Problem, dass es schlecht zu hören ist. Aber jetzt geht es gut, oder? Ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich hier, Frau Schneider-Kempf. Vielen Dank. Peter, it's a great honor and pleasure to have you here. It was in the early 80s when um, a new way of looking at history came to Germany and Wagenbach published a lot of those authors, among them Duby, Georges Duby, Alain Corbin from France, Carlo Ginsburg from Italy, Natalie Simon Davis, Stephen Greenblatt, um, there was Darnton as well, who was already mentioned, and I think you were the first of all those who are, as well, most of them friends of you. And it was 30 years ago that the first book was published in Germany. It was exactly 84, so it's quite a time. But it's not only quite a time, there were so many books following in this time. Actually, the first book I have I should mention this was um, Culture and Society in Renaissance Italy. The German title was quite different or a little bit different. Um, this was a time when we always had very long titles. Die Renaissance in Italien und dann kommt der Untertitel Sozialgeschichte, einer Kultur zwischen Tradition und Erfindung. So this was the first book. And then uh, many books followed, and I counted them, it there were 14, so it's, many books is not the right thing, it is really an understatement to say many books. 14 is really a lot, and I looked in the list of our authors, and I found out that you are the one with the most books in, our, in, our, in the complete list. So this is quite a thing, and there is something to add, it's not that we, not only that we published a lot of books, but they had big, big, um, we, we sold a lot of copies, so we had many of those books, not only in one edition, but in different editions, and I counted this as well, it was in all more than 140 copies, just in our house, so there were as well licensed editions with Fisher and other publishers, so it's quite a lot. I have to say, and we are still very happy to have you here in our house. And I have to add something, that in all those 30 years, you um, consumed five editors, <laughs> you're still here. You consumed three translators, you're still here with us. <laughs> and I have to mention at this uh, point, Matthias Wolf, who translated the last books. So. Um, Since I was in the publishing house, um, it's still, um, I have to count some eins, two, three. Ten books um, came out. The first I was involved in was the book about the Annal, and I think this was the book you mentioned before about the French uh, school of the Annal. And um, a very important book was as well about um, the fabrication of Louis XIV. Um, in Germany was Ludwig der XIV, the Inszenierung des Sonnenkönigs. Um, then, for example, just to tell you what, you, what your books, um, what your books had initiated um, was that uh, the fortunes of a quarter, die Geschicke des Hofmanns zur Wirkung eines renaissance previers über angemessenes Verhalten, um, was that we found out that Castiglione wasn't on the market in Germany, so we had to do two books. We had as well to publish Castiglione so that the people could read the original as well and that what you um, wrote about it. And uh, then, in 2001, the first volume of the Social History of Knowledge, which we now have the second one, came out. The first volume was called a social, uh, was called Papier und Marktgeschrei, die Geburt der Wissensgesellschaft in Germany. And now, together with the second volume, we published this again as a student's edition. So, 14, 14 books of Peter Burks with a big, big, uh, number of copies, but it's not only the quantity. What we find out if we 
look through the manuscripts we get from young scientists, it's interesting to look at the books that they're, if you look at them very carefully, you always find some, in some pieces of Peter Burke in them. So the way they are looking on history and f especially the way they're writing, they, you made a school and I think this is one of the most important things even in Germany. So, thanks a lot for this. Um, ich möchte mich ganz kurz nur bei Josef Vogel bedanken. Wir kennen uns schon sehr lange und wir kennen uns aus München. Wir haben zusammen die Oberseminarbank gedrückt und ich hätte mir eigentlich nicht gedacht, dass wir irgendwann mal wieder die Gelegenheit haben, was zusammen zu machen und ich freue mich darum umso mehr, dass es das heute Abend geklappt hat. Danke. Danke sehr, Susanne. Wir machen natürlich heute Abend was gemeinsam, weil du mich gezwungen hast. Das ist ein ganz einfacher, ganz einfacher Grund. Ich soll auch noch ein paar Worte sagen, da alles gesagt ist, werde ich das nicht tun. Und das, was ich nicht sagen werde, werde ich auch auf Deutsch sagen. Sie werden später noch genügend Gelegenheit haben, unser Englisch, unser beider Englisch zu probieren. Wir haben vorher einen kleinen Versuch gemacht und bemerkt, dass wir uns nicht auf Englisch verständigen können. Das wird ein interessanter Abend werden. Ich möchte vielleicht zwei Dinge noch noch zum Verlauf dieses Abends äh, sagen. Äh, Im Augenblick, äh, äh, gleich im Anschluss äh, an die Vorstellungen, wird äh, Herr Burke äh, eine, ein Mittelding zwischen äh, Lesung und Vortrag halten aus einem der wichtigsten Kapitel aus diesem Buch, aus Kapitel 9 über die Explosion des Wissens. Und anschließend werden Herr Burke und ich versuchen, uns in welcher Sprache auch immer und mit welchen Gesten auch immer, äh, uns hier äh, vorne unter dem Podium äh, zu verständigen. Äh, ich wünsche Ihnen auf jeden Fall einen guten Abend und natürlich sehr viel Geduld. Bis dahin. Well, thank you very much for those introductions. And before I start reading a section of this book in English, I want to say how pleased I am to be back in Berlin, and especially here, and especially now. I mean, pleased to be at a Wagenbach event because it's now 30 years since they started to publish my books. Pleased to be at um, an event in the Staatsbibliothek because in 1989 and 1990, as you just heard, my wife and I, but especially my wife, did a lot of reading research in this very library. And pleased to be back now because, after all, we were here for the fall of the wall and now we're back here just after the celebration of 25 years after. Um, But I want to add that 1989-90 can also be viewed very plausibly as a turning point in the history of knowledge. And that's the argument that I'm going to make now, reading to you the final section of the final chapter of this second volume, which it happens to be called The Age of Reflexivities, And it says 1990 dash because uh, um, I did not know then and do not know now um, when this particular age will give place to another. So, looking back, the last generation seems in, cer in certain ways like a new period in the history of knowledge, with 1989 to 1990 as at least a symbolic turning point. The fall of the wall the collapse of the USSR and other communist regimes brought major changes to knowledge systems too, of which the transformation of the Soviet Academy of Sciences and its satellites was only a very small part. The World Wide Web was also named and began um, to um, operate within CERN in the year 1990. It developed, of course, out of an earlier American military system, ARPANET, but it became available to a much wider public, and it was, in any case, much easier to navigate than its predecessor had been. Economic historians um, also date the fifth Konradtiev wave based on microelectronics, once again to the year 1990. And the technological technologization of knowledge 
continues to accelerate. Milestones include Space Telescope, 1990 once again, Netscape, 1994, Java, 1995, Google, 1998. Satellite photography aids both surveys and, unfortunately, surveillance. The Mars Global Surveyor went into orbit in 1997. Google Earth became um, available to the public in the year 2006. The explosion of information, if not always of knowledge, see that um, epigram, not my epigram, but I, um, but I like it, um, continues apace. Digital data are now measured in gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, and exabytes. Um, that last one is a quintillion bytes. It um, uh, makes me feel dizzy just to think of numbers on that scale. It's been estimated that the whole of humanity produced 150 exabytes of data in the year 2005. But according to a study by a market research company, International Data Corporation, around 1,200 exabytes of digital data would be generated in 2010. I can't imagine what can have happened between 2010 and now if the acceleration is on that scale. No wonder then there have been calls for knowledge management. It's a slogan you hear most of all in business with specialized enterprises offering what they call knowledge management services. The first chief knowledge officer was appointed in 1994. Now, most corporations have them. While managers have been taking a greater interest in knowledge than before, knowledge institutions such as universities have been taking a greater interest in management. Understandably enough, I suppose, since they struggle to maintain their position in an increasingly competitive world, competing not only with one another, but in the field of research, with think tanks, industrial laboratories, and other research institutions. In an earlier part of this book, I refer to a book that the maverick sociologist Thorstein Veblen published as early as 1918. And the subject of this book was the state of the universities. He called it the higher learning in America, but it was reflections on the management of knowledge by businessmen. So if Veblen were around today, I can imagine his sardonic smile at the thought that the similarities between universities and businesses are even closer than he thought they would become in the year 1918. If he were around today, he might even write of the McDonaldization of knowledge, or if you prefer, McKnowledge for short. That is, a combination of mass production, massive growth in student numbers, above all, of course, in the online universities, an attempt to increase efficiency via measurement, student evaluation of professors, citation indexes, research assessment exercises, and so on, you know, as you know very well. Standardization advocated in the sphere of knowledge um, in the 19th century by that fanatic for efficiency, the librarian Melville Dewey, to whom we owe that um, way of cataloging books the, um, on a decimal principle. And, and finally, the replacement of people by machines for parts of the learning process, in language laboratories, for example. And indeed, some universities have called in management consultants to help them increase their efficiency. The everyday working lives of many individual students and scholars have been transformed by the spread of the personal computer. Sometimes I think that my academic life falls into two halves before and after 1985 when I bought my first PC. Then you've got the rise of the 
internet, sometimes described now as the fifth estate. The off-print, um, that old staple of academic communication, whether it was handed out uh, by the author at conferences or sent through the post. And even the duplicated preprint which scientists used to use, they've all been replaced by the emailed article, whether it's unpublished or published. If the value of paper sales of newspapers uh, is in decline, you've got the rise of the e-newspaper and the e-book. And in self-defense, to um, smaller publishers have joined forces and other ones have been taken over by large multinational organizations such as Hachette, uh, once the French railway station bookseller, but now no longer limited to books in French. Elsevier, a Dutch firm still based in Amsterdam and boasting a very famous name from the 17th century, has, produces a wide number of scientific publications in English, even if it charges academics much too much to do so. And one of my Cambridge colleagues, a professor of mathematics, is leading a crusade to get academics to take their articles away from Elsevier. In some ways, the current situation in which electronic and paper versions of books and journals coexist is reminiscent, at least to an early modern historian, which is what I am most of the time, reminiscent of the late 15th century. Of course, the age of the first European printed books. The new medium of communication did not drive out manuscripts. The two media coexisted and they interacted. And finally, that means about a century after Gutenberg, a kind of division of labor between them became established. Manuscript for, not only for secret information, but for the, um, the kind of writing that the author thought should only circulate within some select circle. Poems circulating among noble poets, for example. Now, my own vision of the future may be too optimist, but anyway, is that paper books and e-books will coexist for a considerable time in a similar way, even though the downsizing of the book is rather likely. I mean that metaphorical downsizing, that is, the paper book won't be as important in knowledge as it was before people went online. But also, I mean literal downsizing, because I think that books are going to become shorter, um, smaller, shorter books for readers who are acquiring more and more of their information from other sources and are at least accused by an older generation of not having a very long attention span. Another trend, the globalization of knowledge is, of course, so palpable one hardly needs to speak about it. Because the increasing use of um, PCs and the internet has eroded the traditional distinctions between centers of knowledge, what Bruno Latour famously called centers of calculation, and the rest, the so-called peripheries or the provinces. Marshall McLuhan's celebrated phrase, the global village, remains an exaggeration, but it's a lot more accurate now than it was when in his own time. After all, he died in 1980 before he was able to see, and I'm sure he would have celebrated, um, the trends I'm now talking about. So going on with globalization, since 1989, there's been a great leap forward in international collaboration for both economic reasons and cultural reasons. In a certain phase of big science, 50s, 60s, the support of the state was necessary and international rivalries, especially the obvious rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, encouraged big spending by both of those great powers. Eventually, though, big science became too big for any one state to support 
even in North America. The, the Hubble Space Telescope, another um, uh, event, if that is the right word, of 1990, cost $2 billion. No wonder then that international competition in space has been replaced to a considerable extent by collaboration. The International Space Station, for example. Then again, in Europe, nuclear physics is supported by the European Union via CERN. So this project too was driven by financial necessity because particle accelerators don't exactly come cheaply. The Large Hadron Collider cost about $9 billion. But all the same, the fact that all these physicists get together in Geneva because that's where the equipment is, has done a lot to create a European community of scientists, or at the very least, since we live in an age of specialization, a community of particle physicists. The trend to globalization has been assisted, of course, not only by the thaw of the political ice age, but also by the rise of English as the new Latin, the lingua franca of the Commonwealth of Learning. Increasingly used in scholarly journals, irrespective of their place of publication. Used in university courses in many countries where the native language is not English, from the Netherlands to Singapore. Of course, it's not the rise of the English I'm speaking, it's the rise of global English, sometimes known as globish. Um, and the consequences of this are very important, whether they're thought to be desirable or undesirable. Uh, you have the unequal exchange of texts. Many more studies are translated from English than are translated into English. Indeed, scholarly books and articles in English cite texts in other languages much less often than the other way around. Scholars in a number of countries, from Sweden to Brazil, are under pressure from the heads of their universities to publish in English rather than in their own language in order to raise the international prestige of their institutions. And of course, the rise of English language search engines such as Google intensifies the trend. There's been an attempt by the French to compete with their own search engine, Quiro, um, um, launched in 2005. But I don't think that, relatively speaking, it has made all that much headway. Another major trend after globalization is what one might call, at least optimistically, the democratization of knowledge, at least in the sense of its increasing accessibility to many people in many places. Following, of course, in the footsteps of 19th century developments, which are discussed earlier in this book, like the rise of public libraries and of mechanics institutes, other uh, institutions for self-improvement. Libraries and their contents, including many rare books and pamphlets to the joy of historians and other scholars, have become much more accessible to readers thanks to digitization. There have been moves even to make many archives accessible online. An archive without walls um, to, that can be reached by the general public without the problem of going to the archive and being initiated in the ways of the archive, which is, was the traditional way of going back to the primary sources. Museums have become more accessible to visitors. As a child in the 1940s, I can remember what it was like to visit the British Museum, where um, the way that an object would be identified would be simply be an extremely laconic label with a place and a date. But now you have full descriptions placed on the walls, film shows in adjoining rooms to tell people about the context of the objects and the cases, and so on. Databases, uh, or data banks, speed up research. 
Of course, they go back before this period. The protein data bank goes back to the year 1971, but they really have proliferated in the last, um, since 1990, and they've increased in size. They range from Légis France, which is concerned simply with French law, to the census of marine life, or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has been described as having collected more data in its first few weeks than had been amassed in the entire earlier history of astronomy. Extraordinary claim. Google Earth makes images of places and information about them available at high speed. Of course, the monopolistic tendencies of Google are worrying, like the privatization by means of patents of what had once been public knowledge, the trend to what's been called information feudalism. Uh, when companies take up, um, um, especially pharmaceutical companies, they take up traditional remedies um, known in India or in Brazil, um, and they try to monopolize them, even sell them back to the, the culture in which these remedies had been discovered and employed in the first place. Again, search engines uh, generally work more for the benefit of the owner or advertiser than the user. Hence, one, one needs a, great, a certain amount of skill in order to navigate quickly to what you want to see rather than what somebody else wants you to see. All the same, this monopolization, the possibility of monopolization, has been countered by some academic projects like JSTOR, a non-profit service making learned journals accessible online, or the History eBook project established by the American Council of Learned Societies. And thanks to their use of new media, the open or long distance universities have reached many more students than traditional universities could possibly do. By the year 2000, student numbers had risen to about 2 million in Britain, 14 million in the United States, and in China, the television university system alone reached 600,000 students. The net has also encouraged citizen science, that is, um, non-expert volunteers gathering information about climate change or about the flight of birds and then passing it on to the professional scientists for further analysis. Turning to politics, the internet has been described as a great force for democracy, cyber democracy, making political information much more widely available, but also helping the organizers of political movements to gather supporters, organize meetings, and organize protests. Blogging allows individuals to make their voices heard much more easily than traditional means like writing to the newspaper. Once again, though, we find a countervailing force. Excuse me. If the dissidents were the first to discover the potential uses of the net for their purposes, Many governments, including some authoritarian regimes, have not been slow to catch up. Some use the net to track the dissidents. Others encourage its use for entertainment purposes as a new version of opium for the people. And of course, uh, and quite a number of regimes try to censor the internet. I suppose the most uh, um, best known example is the Chinese Golden Shield Project, sometimes described as the Great Firewall of China. Of course, authoritarian regimes are quite right to be alarmed at a time when former secrets of state, especially but far from exclusively in the former communist world, have become public knowledge. Secret police files have been, become accessible um, especially to the people um, named in the files, while the sites of nuclear research 
and labor camps have finally been shown on maps of Russia. Demands that other governments become increasingly transparent have become more and more common. Freedom of Information Acts have been passed in many countries. And confidential information, of course, is leaked more and more often. But the democratization of knowledge has also affected encyclopedias, notably, of course, Wikipedia, founded in 2001. And now, looking back, it's quite hard to imagine how we managed without it. It's true that the original plan for something that was called Newpedia was much more traditional. The idea was to have an online encyclopedia, much like the Britannica, that is, professional editors who would then give topics to specialists. And then suddenly the plan changed so that, I quote, anyone can edit any page at any time. A change that has been plausibly linked to the ethos of sharing and openness in the computing culture at MIT, Stanford, and other universities. So the new plan made Wikipedia into a flagship of citizen science, in the broad sense of the term science, and a leading example of a trend towards amateurization. Of course, we still have professionalization, but it's nothing new in history that you get opposite trends coexisting and interacting just at the same time. Of course, the price of amateurization is often inaccuracy, but though um, there have been studies of this and not to anything like the same extent that one might have expected. If you compare Wikipedia with the Britannica in um, select cases, uh, the difference in the number of errors in articles in particular subjects is really quite small. And of course, Wikipedia differs from printed encyclopedias in quite a number of ways. It's larger. Um, 3.5 million articles in English in the year 2010. Imagine all that printed on paper. It's available in more languages, at least 25. Since I wrote that in 2011, it must be out of date. It must be more languages by now. It's in perpetual revision or reconstruction in contrast to the time lags between successive editions of the Britannica, La Rousse, Rock House, and so on. As often, innovation has led to problems. The problem of interference or vandalism, uh, deleting articles, introducing unfavorable comments on individuals, or introducing advertising. Wikipedia is also distinctive for what, despite the danger of anthropomorphism, I'd like to call its self-criticism, represented uh, very vividly by what you might call intellectual health warnings. Um, so you, op you click on an article and you find at the top of it, the neutrality of this article is disputed, or again, this article needs additional citations for verification. Please help improve this article by adding reliable references. Unsourced material may be challenged or removed. One only wishes that the editors of printed encyclopedias could do the same, but of course, te the technology is against it. And finally, Wikipedia off offers a vivid example of another important recent trend, which gave its name to this particular section of the book, reflexivity. Discussions of the knowledge society often emphasize, I quote, the increase in the ability of society to act upon itself. The constant revision of social practices in the light of knowledge of those practices. Uh, another quotation, what's specific to the informational mode of development? 
um, that's getting nearer jargon I'd rather not use, but is the action of knowledge upon knowledge itself as the main source of productivity. The management of information for business has itself become a successful business. The reflexive sociology of Pierre Bourdieu, encouraging sociologists to become more sharply aware of the effect of their own social position on the way they see society, is really characteristic of our time. Historians, too, are becoming more and more aware of their place in history and the extent to which that shapes that want their views of the past. As for scientists, it was Tim Berners-Lee who called the rise of information about information the beginning of a new enlightenment. So uh, it's not surprising to find that Karl Mannheim's idea that knowledge is socially situated, an idea that um, inspired me to write both volumes, it's been revived. The growth, there's a growth of interest now in older enterprises like the history of historical thought, the sociology of sociology, or the anthropology, geography, or social history of science, and even, especially here in Germany, of knowledge itself. Wissen, Soziologie, Wissenschaftsgeschichte, Wissensgeschichte. Research has become itself the object of research on the part of sociologists and historians, and not only the research assessments imposed on universities. The rise in interest in all this has been expressed in familiar ways, such as the foundation of new academic chairs, new university courses, new academic journals, associations, and so on. There's an institution for the study of human knowledge in Los Altos, California. There are journals like Zeitschrift für Wissenschaftsforschung or Knowledge Organization. There are associations like Society for Social Studies of Science, International Society for Knowledge Organization. So at the opening of this book, which I won't read to you now, I noted a growing interest in histories of knowledge. More and more recruits to the History of Knowledge Brigade, the Max Planck Institute for Wissenschaftsgeschichte here in Berlin, founded 1994. Among economic historians, you now find some specializing in the study of knowledge as a form of capital. The European Research Council recently funded a project also by economic historians on the place of useful and reliable knowledge in the global history of material progress. The phrase cultures of knowledge or cultures of learning, that these phrases have come into use to describe a number of academic projects in a number of different places, from Oxford to Frankfurt. Conversely, the University of Augsburg supports a project on cultures of ignorance, or Nichtwissenskulturen. And a chair in early modern European cultures of knowledge was recently established at the University of Erfurt. In short, like its predecessor, Social History of Knowledge, Volume 1, the present volume forms part of a trend. I only hope that the next generation will take this kind of research much further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter Burke, uh, for this uh, short insight uh, in uh, your book, in your two books, in your project. Um, this project you called yourself as a, 
a big picture. It's a big picture about uh, the relation between society and knowledge, um, uh, about the history of knowledge, and especially about the presence of knowledge. Um, and in this big picture, like a tableau, gemelde, whatever, uh, uh, you have different scenes. There are amusing scenes, there are some scenes which uh, look like idyllic, yeah. there are some serious, very serious scenes, and there are especially also some very dangerous scenes. Yeah? And I would like to, bring, uh, to talk about a very dangerous scene in this book, which is linked, you divine it, uh, which is linked to the notion of explosion. So, for me, as a pacifist, explosion uh, is something linked to battlefields. Um, explosion is linked to something which can be called an accident. Mm -hmm. Explosion makes a bang. Mm -hmm. um, and after an explosion, you have victims, you have destruction, mm -hmm. you have confusion, mm -hmm. or something like that. And now, you call this explosion of knowledge. Uh, what is the result of the explosion of knowledge? Or what is explosion in your understanding? Fine, I should say at the start that in English the um, second volume was not called The Knowledge Explosion. That was, I think, um, a brilliant idea on the part of Wagenbach. Um, it was a phrase Susanne. I used myself <laughs> in the book. She's falsifying but, your book. Yeah, it, yeah it's, okay. it's there in the early pages of this volume, but I hadn't okay. had the idea of actually putting it right on the title page. And I chose it um, for two reasons in particular. Um, I, mean, I wanted an ambivalent, um, I wanted to, to express ambivalence. So knowledge explosion meant expansion, because the, um, the, but it also meant fragmentation. So, um, the good and the bad um, mixed up together. You've in enriched the concept by talking about um, other possible meanings of explosion, which I'm also happy to accept, because I, I didn't want to offer, shall we say, a triumphalist account of knowledge. Um, marvelous things have happened in the period um, covered by this book in different spheres of knowledge, but there have been um, all sorts of developments which one can only regret as well, uh, in, in similar fashion, um, I'm not um, putting forward uh, the thesis of decline as, as central to the book. Um, I'm trying to keep these two aspects in balance, uh, what we're gaining, what we're losing from the changes that are taking place under our eyes. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there's some very dangerous about explosions. Uh, and uh, I think you write in your book uh, that uh, you have, in a certain way, a pessimistic view on this explosion, which you call yourself expansion, yes. fragmentation, mm. which leaves us in a certain way of certain sort of uh, uh, confusion, or even uh, you called it information anxiety. Mm. Mm. Um, I, uh, I want to, uh, uh, to, to keep this notion of explosion because there is uh, uh, another notion of explosion which is coming from a completely different uh, area, which is coming from Russia, which is coming from Yuri Lotman. Uh, probably uh, you know his books on uh, culture and explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, explosion has a completely different notion, a different uh, meaning in a certain way. Uh, and there, Explosion means, first, the irritation of cultural codes. Mm. Uh, second, it's something which happens at uh, the periphery yeah. of our knowledge. And third, uh, and this is very interesting, uh, it introduces in our culture something like the unexpected. Mm. This means a development which is not at all expectable, mm. uh, which is sort of chaos, or a sort of turbulence, and which can develop in each direction. Uh, for uh, Yuri Lotman, I think this is very important because this is the moment of innovation. Mm -hmm. If there's an explosion in culture, uh, there is the condition or the possibility of innovation. Do, uh, does your uh, notion of explosion have any parentry, um, any um, relationship to, uh, to this Lotman? Uh, uh, well, I mean. definitely like the idea that um, change often takes place not gradually, but in a sudden burst. On the other hand, the more um, meanings we pack into the term explosion, uh, 
um, the more confused we may be. Um, I, um, I'm certainly not against the use of uh, metaphors in academic books. I, um, and indeed, uh, in you have scientific a lot of metaphors research, in there. Yeah. Um, a metaphor is even a tool, but I like to remember the warning that um, a Swedish anthropologist who happens to be a friend of mine well, once made. He said, um, it's okay to take a ride on a metaphor as long as you know where to get off. And I'm afraid that that's too, too much diff and too various a content being packed into this phrase. Um, I'm, I, perhaps I, I'd rather stick to the idea of two basic meanings, one uh, relatively beneficent and, and the other not. Okay, so let's uh, leave uh, metaphors and uh, let's come to the next metaphor, uh, which are written on the wall here. Information giants yeah. and knowledge dwarfs. Yeah. Can you explain this? This seems to be a description of our situation, yeah. of our present situation, yeah. and this is your most important epigram yeah. in, this, um, in this book. Yeah. So let me say um, at the start that in, uh, I, I like to distinguish information from knowledge in the sense that information is relatively raw, but I want to stress relatively. And information by, and knowledge by contrast has been processed. I like to say it's been cooked. It's gone through these processes such as classification, textualization, verification, systematization, and so on. Now, I think one problem today is this very speed with which the relatively raw information is accumulating. I mean, I'm, I, um, even with all the people now working in the so-called knowledge industries, there aren't enough of them to, um, to analyze uh, what's coming in. Um, I think um, before they can f finish one the batch that's come in, um, much more has come in. Of course, like so many other things, this could have a good side as well as a bad side. It means that the, all that surveillance data, um, well, the secret services haven't got time to analyze all of it, and so some of us may have our privacy safe, not because they didn't mean to invade it, but because they, they just aren't the working hours available to go through the data. This illustrates some, a point I like to make and make in the book, I think, in one point or another, which is in the history of knowledge and maybe in history to court, uh, every solution to a problem will turn out in the long run to raise problems of its own. And I think that's the human condition. That's something we simply have to live with. <clears throat> so. Uh, um I did my homework and I just noted some in informations, yeah. some informations uh, for this um, uh, information explosion. Sorry for this metaphor. Um, and um, it's very interesting that uh, the quantities of information um, transmitted in the net since 1986 uh, increases 20% each year. Yeah. So six times the economic growth. Uh, second, very interesting, the storage capacity of information today is now more than 100 times as much as in 1986. Uh, and the processing power of computers today uh, increase 60% um, each year. Yeah. Uh, it's an enormous uh, development, enormous growth or increase. Um, but nevertheless, um, um, I have... Uh, two or three questions about information and knowledge once more. Um, so the notion of information uh, um, refers to something which is completely formed, information. And I cannot understand because, uh, why do you call it raw? Uh, information is something which is completely organized, it's a code, uh, it's technified, it's no raw material. It's a completely cultivated um, uh, matter. Why do, do you call it raw? I don't think I ever used the word wrong. Raw, raw. <laughs> but, it's, um, but there is a lot of... The opposite of cooked. Yes, cooked. Okay. Yeah. And, and, oh, yes, oh, sorry, raw. Yes, raw. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, um, I yeah, told you this would be very difficult. <laughs> raw versus relatively cooked. 
So yeah. you, you have no, a lot but of uh, did yeah. you ever yeah. did you ever eat a plate relatively cooked? <laughs> what is a what is a dinner relatively cooked? Relatively cooked, I don't understand. Because um, you could always go on cooking. And, Medium um, rare. And now this is where the metaphor breaks down because <laughs> you, one can overcook food. But I think that going on with the process of analyzing information and turning it into knowledge, um, there's no place to stop. So there's a disanalogy, if I may use okay. that word, which I don't think is accepted in English dictionaries, but mm. We need, we need it all the same. Okay. Uh, so I'm asking about this relation between information and knowledge, mm. because we are finally talking about two different uh, concepts. Uh, are we now in a knowledge society, or are we now in an information society? Uh, giants, giants of information, dwarfs of uh, knowledge. What, what do you mean? What, uh, how would you define this present situation? Well, of course, it's a mixture, but I'm a f I fear that um, we are more of an information society than we are of a knowledge society. That's one of our problems. Um, and um, can you, f so for us, knowledge is one of the most difficult terms. Where is the difference between knowledge and non-knowledge? Uh, uh, what is the difference between knowledge and opinion? Yeah. What is the difference between knowledge and, for example, cognition? Mm -hmm. uh, why did you choose this very broad um, concept of knowledge to describe the history which uh, concerns, uns, uh, concerns us uh, uh, immediately? Yeah, basically I wanted to avoid uh, over specialization. Um, I could have written a book about um, what I know best, the history of historical thought and writing. Um, I could have written um, a history of academic disciplines. Mm. But I, um, as you remarked at the very beginning of our conversation, I, I, I really did want to present a big picture. And to present a big picture, you've got to use some rather general concepts. You pay a certain price for that, a lack of precision. Um, but I think um, there isn't any way out if you're going to attempt to achieve that kind of enterprise. And I continue to believe that somebody ought to be trying to fit the pieces together and present the big picture. And that leads us um, away, indeed, from just Wissenschaft to Wissen, the most general term of all. Uh, so it's very interesting that you begin uh, in both of your books, mm -hmm. in both of your books, uh, with a um, notion of logical knowledge which is, which is very broad. Yes. This means explicit, implicit knowledge, yes. uh, conscient, unconscious uh, knowledge, yes. uh, specialized, generalized knowledge, etc., and yes. so on. Um, and then your focus explicitly is on academic knowledge. Yes. And um, um, so this is a very clear decision. This means linked to institutions, mm. linked to certain practices, yes. linked to certain closed communities. Yes. Yeah? Um, and uh, may I ask you, uh, why didn't you talk about, for example, about experimental knowledge mm. and laboratories? Mm. You don't lose any word about laboratories and experimental sciences. And on the other hand, which for example for us is very important, uh, uh, what's about art, mm. fiction, mm. literature? Yeah. They don't have any place in your history of, uh, of knowledge. Mm. Uh, it's a strange, um, um, a strange blank, uh, mm. and I wonder, there must be some decision behind that. Yes, you've correctly identified a major tension between what I would like to do and what I think I am able to do. Um, I, I, ideally, I would have written about every kind of human knowledge, and I would write about it for every part of the world. But my own knowledge of knowledge is rather limited, and I thought that I would uh, privilege, I would, um, I would focus on academic knowledge, which I'm more familiar with, in the West, the cult, where I read more languages. Um, of course, that there's, a, there's a price to pay for that decision. Um, in a way, 
I was trying to have the best of both worlds because I announced that I was going to try to situate this Western academic knowledge in a wider context by talking about interactions between that kind of knowledge or, or the, that bundle of knowledges in the plural and all the other knowledges. But um, you can imagine if I had really tried not only to follow your suggestion and write about literature, but about craft knowledges and about Chinese knowledge and Indian knowledge. Um, I wouldn't have published either volume yet. <laughs> but this is the problem. You wrote about Chinese knowledge. You wrote about uh, Islamic knowledge. Yeah. You wrote about Indian knowledge. Yeah. But you didn't write about German literature. <laughs> 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 okay, um, um, it's simply a sort of, uh, I don't uh, know how to say it in English, a certain, uh, certain krank krankung for German uh, literature, coming from German literature. But I have another question, um, I think which uh, is, could be very important for us. Uh, the de decision to write a history of academic knowledge is also a uh, decision to write about this very important institutional um, uh, organization, this organization which is academia, which is uh, royal academies, yeah. which are universities, etc. Um, would you say that uh, our present situation has changed this kind of academic knowledge fundamentally? Um, do you yourself for example, also as a teacher in, United, uh, in, in, in Great Britain, uh, do you see any uh, dramatical change in the um, position, in the status, and the function of academ uh, academic knowledge today? Yes, I began my academic career um, in the early 60s, and I do think I've noticed a big change over that time, the biggest single change, which cuts across all, all sorts of disciplines, is that um, the, the scholar's sense of um, being professional has changed. That is, um, there are fewer scholars who feel that they've got a monopoly of worthwhile knowledge about a certain subject. Uh, in the 70s, I was part of this history workshop movement in England, um, which was based on the idea that Ordinary people have insights into history because of their own life experience that um, the historians with a different kind of experience don't have and that the, um, the way to write a richer history is to have dialogue between these different groups. Um, uh, uh, my friend, the late Raphael Samuel, used to teach trade unionists, ad adults, in Ruskin College, Oxford. And he would start by asking them to describe their own factory, uh, because they could do that from experience. And then st to start to study the history of that factory, which they would understand much better than he would, because it was close to their experience. And then they'd realize that they could do history, that they could make a contribution. But most academics in the 60s and even the 70s were a bit suspicious of all this. And I feel that the barriers have um, come down further. I wouldn't say they've disappeared, but I think um, fewer scholars feel that professionals in their discipline have the monopoly of knowledge in that field. And that, I think, is an extremely positive change over the last 30 or 40 years. And I think it's got some connection with some of the trends described in this book. Um, so our experience, I don't know if I can speak for all of my colleagues or of, yeah. uh, colleagues at university, our experience is that we have uh, at least three interesting developments yeah. uh, uh, which we like or don't like. The first is uh, a certain de deinstitutionalization of knowledge. So um, knowledge is no longer linked to universities, schools, mm -hmm. but we have something in the European Union like lifelong learning, etc. Yeah, yeah. So deinstitutionalization. Um, a second uh, important point is that uh, um, we are in a certain way forced not to teach something, yeah. but to teach learning. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, give them the skills that they can learn, yeah. but don't teach them this or that. Uh, don't be a sort of fool which, uh, um, uh, which um, mediates data, uh, um, expert knowledge, etc. Yes. And the third, I think, uh, for us, um, 
a very difficult situation is uh, uh, that knowledge now is the object of harsh competition. Mm. Uh, that universities, faculties, uh, um, cities, uh, whatever, are competing against each other via the question of, yeah. uh, of, of knowledge. Is this also your impression? Yes, it is. Um, and I totally agree with you that what we should be teaching in universities and indeed in schools is how, how to learn for oneself. But there is an, um, a paradox here, that is, it's easiest to teach that approach to learning if you work with very small groups. And if you work with very small groups, as I was lucky to do in my Cambridge career, often teaching one or two students at a time rather than a hundred people. Um, that's wonderful, but then of course only a tiny proportion of the population can, can go through this system. There aren't many universities that can afford to teach in ones and twos. So it's a movement to democratize knowledge, which it seems is most easily inculcated in elitist institutions. Mm. But there are many paradoxes in the history of knowledge, and um, that's just one of them. Uh, in, your, um, in the second book, so uh, the book about the explosion of knowledge, yeah. I found this wonderful uh, concept of agnotology. Yeah. Agnotology, yeah. uh, linked to two other very interesting uh, concepts, um, uh, the Wikimorg yeah. and uh, the Dilitopedia. Dilitopedia, could you explain what this is? So what was the could, you, could you explain what it is? Agnotology, yeah. Dilitopedia and Wikimorg. <laughs> um, the, the first one is easy. Agnotology is the study of ignorance or as uh, anthropologist recently put it, a study of regimes of ignorance. That is, um, different institutions um, placing a stress on some kinds of knowledge, therefore can be regarded as encouraging um, ignorance about something else. Or take the case of intellectual paradigms. They've, if you like, they have um, a sunny side and a dark side because a paradigm has got to be relatively simple in order to be useful, but it becomes simple at the price of excluding some important aspects of reality. And so what we need to look at the paradigm from the negative point of view as well as the positive. But then there are the uses of ignorance. That is, um, it may, is it useful in society for some people to be ignorant of some things? Um, what's it like? Um, in the world of diplomatic negotiations, if absolutely everyone in the two countries involved knows at the very time that the negotiations are going on what the arguments are about. You can't make compromises in that case. You wouldn't be able to do your job of negotiating. So um, it's problems like this which are being studied in a sociological way, anthropological way, historical way, under this umbrella term of agnotology. Um, so this is, uh, I just uh, explained it to the public. Uh, I think this uh, is one of most interesting uh, chapters in your yeah. uh, book, um, that uh, there is a history of knowledge which is completely and immediately linked to the history of the disappearing of knowledge yes. and losing knowledge, yes. forbidden knowledge, uh, um, uh, knowledge which cannot longer, longer found, yes. etc. Um, what would you say, um, and I thought about this uh, agnotology, yes. um, yes. and I thought uh, one of the most famous agnotologists <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, could, be, uh, could have been Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Because Nietzsche once said, uh, um, to live on, uh, we must forget. Yeah. To live on, we must having, uh, have something like oblivion. Would you agree with Nietzsche? Is this a sort of Nietzschean point of view in your book? <laughs> yes, and I would bring in Schumpeter and use the phrase creative destruction as well in the case of This is Schumpeter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Nietzsche or Schumpeter? <laughs> you prefer Schumpeter? Um, I don't think they're competing in the same <laughs> league. Each, um, they're both valuable in, in different ways, but I thought the Schumpeterian phrase was a way of summarizing what I believe Nietzsche to be doing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think this is very important to note it now. Yeah. So, um, Schumpeter is com 
completing Nietzsche's idea of destruction. He believed that destruction was necessary for creativity to take place, yes. Okay, um, um, I got it. <laughs> um, uh, let's uh, switch um, uh, probably for, for our last, um, yeah. uh, uh, last episode of our, mm -hmm. our talk. Uh, let, let's switch to your own um, position as an historian. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, but please correct me, I have the impression that you have the old uh, illness mm. of an historian, uh, a sort of schizophrenia mm. of an historian, um, which always follows two lines. The first line is that history is change, hmm. that history is transformation, that history is uh, modification, hmm. that history is alteration. Hmm. Yeah? You follow the path of history and you see change. And on the other hand, and this is also in your book, uh, if you look closely, you say as a historian, all already happened. Uh, if you look close, you have information society in the 18th century. Mm. If you look close, you have an explosion of knowledge in the 18th century. Mm. So nothing changed. And this is a very special historical illness or illness of an historian that all is changed and never ever changed. What would you say? I suppose I want to avoid the two extremes. I don't um, want to say um, that every year or two, there's a total revolution in the way that we see the world. And I don't want to say either that ever since there've been human beings, they just regard the world in exactly the same way. So I, I uh, think of myself and many of my colleagues too, as trying to achieve a um, balance and equ equilibrium between two positions, each of which is extremely easy to exaggerate. That's why somebody founded a historical periodical called Continuity and Change. Um, one that, um, right, that they are, it's an opposition, but um, in life, one doesn't exclude the other. But, but what do you say? So, um, um, and you talked, for example, you mm. talked in your books also about uh, Michel Foucault. Um, and um, I think it's very clear that as an historian, you must make a distinction or a decision between designing a history of discontinuity mm. and ruptures or a history of continuity and developments. What would you say? Is this, a, I think it's, it's a very interesting and I think important methodological decision. Mm. Discontinuity or continuity, rupture or development. I don't think it's a conscious decision. I think, um, one is drawn maybe to a subject rather than another subject because one is drawn to continuity and the topic one chooses is one that lends itself to continuity. Mm. I, I see historians as operating in that semi-conscious way rather than um, waking up one morning and saying, I'm, um, my method is going to be to emphasize continuity. But whichever one does, I think it's very important then to look at the other. Just I think it's very important to turn problems upside down. Um, I, that's why I like the history of ignorance, because it was turning the history of knowledge upside down, and that turns out to be illuminating. Mm -hmm. So you look for what the paradigm you were working with yourself has excluded, and, and try to enrich it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a continuity person, and I suppose I'm more of a continuity person than a revolution person, I feel an obligation to be also looking at revolutions, and I hope that the revolution people feel the obligation to look also for continuities. Um, uh, uh, let me uh, make a, a last uh, approach mm. um, to this situation of writing history. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, to you as an historian. Yeah. Um, the first question would be, um, uh, uh, is there a, a change in your narrative, in your way of narrating history, uh, a change caused by this explosion of information or explosion of knowledge. Did it change um, your way of uh, telling the story of history? Not as far as I know. What has affected my thinking about narrative is the need to present events from a multiple, from multiple points of view. Mm. 
and that cut, that intersects um, with problems of narrative that people have writing fiction as well as in writing history. And I've learned a lot, for example, from um, um, William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, because you've got the same events presented um, through four points of view. And um, that's something that historians can really do, even if they should focus more on collective points of view rather than individual ones. Um, writing a history of a civil war and deliberately incorporating the way each side sees the other rather than the old-fashioned historical ideal which was to be impartial, not to share either point of view. I think it's um, in that way that you, if you tell the impartial story, there's something important missing. I think um, if you try to tell the, the opposite partial stories in the same book, that's much richer and people will understand much better why people started killing one another in Spain in 1936 or whatever it is. Um, uh, this is very clear in your book that there's a certain tension mm. in there, a tension between opposite trends, yes. yeah? uh, nationalization, uh, denationalization, yeah. um, centralization, decentralization, yeah. etc. Um, but uh, once more, uh, going back to the situation of writing history, uh, under certain media conditions. Uh, you probably know the thesis of Ian Watts and, um, um, and Jack Goody mm. that history, uh, writing history, historiography only could uh, begin uh, by condition of a writing culture because the writing culture in, uh, in antique societies made the distinction between past and present. Mm. Um, and uh, my question aims to the role of new media, like television, mm -hmm. but especially digital media and history. Uh, how, what would you say, how could this so-called digital culture change mm -hmm. our concept of history, or your concept of history, uh, your um, um, approach to a historical question at all? Yes, I don't know the, um, the digital world well enough to give you a straight answer, but I can say that I think that working in different media um, is an enriching experience for historians. And so um, working with images rather than only with texts and maybe trying to incorporate um, different media in the way in which history is taught in universities. Um, one couldn't have done this in Cambridge because um, one wouldn't have been allowed to, to do it. But a friend of mine who became my colleague in Cambridge before that, he taught in Portsmouth Polytechnic. If you teach history in a polytechnic in the 1970s or 80s, um, you've got a certain freedom that you don't have in a conventional university. So he taught the German Reformation by asking the students collectively to make a film about the Reformation. So they'd have to decide who's going to act Luther, but what words are they going to put in Luther's mouth? Um, what kind of um, spokesperson will they have for the Catholic point of view, and so on. And I think one could learn something by that in that way, which one couldn't learn in the orthodox textual way. I would hope that in the case of digital media, there would be a similar sort of breakthrough. So a, a sort of reenactment, or yeah. okay. Um, perhaps a last question to this. It's uh, uh, um, today I looked into Hayden White's uh, uh, book um, just to know what sort of historian you are, and um, uh, and in <laughs> and in the classification of Hayden White, I would say uh, you are the type of an ironic historian. Is it true? That would definitely be the option I would have chosen for myself. <laughs> and indeed, one of my historian heroes is indeed Jakob Burkhardt. Exactly, and yeah. The, um, and yeah. Hayden... And for Hayden, Jakob yeah, Burkhardt is the type. chooses him as the arch-exemplar, yes. Mm. Uh, hey, uh, I'm really uh, glad to have uh, to make this point here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, if you agree, uh, we could uh, open the question to the public. Uh, yes, fine. Yeah? yeah. Uh, ähm, Sie können also, äh, sind eingeladen, ähm, Fragen zu stellen. Ähm, auf Englisch oder Deutsch, äh, äh, sollten die Fragen auf Deutsch kommen, will ich versuchen, die so korrupt wie möglich zu übersetzen. Ähm, äh, gibt es denn 
Fragen äh, Ihrerseits aus dem Publikum an Herrn Peter Berg. I think we must be yeah. patient a little bit. Yeah. Uh, hello, um, I'm Oliver Jans. Um, my question is, um, what, in your opinion, is changing in, ter in, in, the, in the current revolution uh, of informational revolution uh, with the internet, basically? Um, the information in the internet take Wikipedia is non-linear, that, meaning that um, you are reading an article and you come across a term and you stop reading this article because you're interested in the term you came across and say, oh, I would like to know more about that. You click on the term and you are in the next article. So the way you navigate, you're navigating a lot from one text to another, from one yeah. article to another, for instance, in this case. and. Um, Whereas uh, traditionally you're reading a text and you come across a term and you, you say, well, I would, I, I would need, or, or a person or whatever, uh, and you say, I would need, uh, like to, to, to know more about it, but you don't have the book at home or you're in a yeah. library and you don't have the book mm. in this particular library, so you're just stuck. And so basically the question is, what does this, this new, these new possibilities of navigation in the internet between various containers of knowledge and so on and so forth, what do they do to knowledge? Is there a, quali a change of quality or is it just that the fact that it makes, that navigating is easier and that's it? Well, there's a change in the way we find things out and I'm asking myself and unable to answer my question whether a change in the way of finding things out, I'm not saying research because I'd like to keep the word research for working from the sources, whether that will affect the way we think, especially if um, it, this change takes place at a relatively early age. I don't, um, it's no good observing oneself if um, for half one's academic career and all one's life before being an academic, um, one used paper books and often read them from the beginning to the end. I don't want, though, to exaggerate the difference between Wikipedia and other encyclopedias because the, pr the printed encyclopedias were also um, books not to be read but to be used um, as reference works. Um, as far as I know, only Aldous Huxley read the Encyclopedia Britannica from the first article to the last. So if we're thinking about the atomization of knowledge, that goes back to the alphabetical principle in encyclopedias. That means it goes back to the um, encyclopedie and to Chambers' cyclopedia in the 18th century. Um, but what one doesn't see is the other side. That is, when they edited the encyclopedie, yeah, Diderot and D'Alembert talked about um, alphabetical organization versus another way of organizing knowledge, um, which would show the links between different subjects, the tree of knowledge. Um, with regret, they decided that they, they ought to organize their encyclopedia alphabetically, although their predecessors had usually gone for the other one. So I'm asking myself whether in the digital age that there could be an equivalent. Um, what, would it like, what would it be like if you gave the um, founder of Wikipedia the challenge of showing the way in which different parts of knowledge fit together? I suspect that the short answer he would give would be in any Wikipedia article there are references to other articles. And so you click and you can go, uh, and then in that next article, there are references to still other articles and you can click your way <laughs> across knowledge. But I'm not sure that that's enough of an answer because um, it's an interesting set of association of ideas that one's following. But does it tell one really about the way in which different fields of knowledge are related? Um, 
I'm not sure I can answer my own question, so I stop there. Uh, may I add uh, yes. uh, simply one word? Uh, I think this is a very important uh, distinction you made. So there is a certain relationship between deconcentration and knowledge. And I think in the encyclopedias in the 18th century, yes. you can make this distinction. Um, and I think it's very important that you say that the encyclopédie of mm. Diderot d'Alembert and the, on the one hand side is alphabetic, yes. and on the other hand, it's systematic. Mm. So it's uh, still a systematic uh, order of things. But there's another and very famous German project, uh, uh, the most famous uh, German encyclopedia in the uh, 18th century, the so-called Zedler yes. Universal um, Lexicon, which is only alphabetic, which has no coherence mm. without an alphabetic coherence, and is it completely anti-systematic? And I think this would be the origin of our Wikipedia uh, yeah. knowledge. And um, uh, I refer to, to a very uh, important book, probably you know it, of Ulrich uh, Johannes Schneider, um, uh, The Invention of General Knowledge. Um, yeah. and, uh, and he focuses exactly on this um, aspect. Uh, when does um, the idea and the reality of anti-systematic knowledge mm. uh, begin. And he, uh, he made a very uh, important impact in this, uh, in this uh, Sedler uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, encyclopedia in Germany. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Sorry for that. Yeah, Please. Uh, yeah, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Kandim. Yeah, at the beginning of your discussion, uh, you, you talked about information and knowledge. Uh, so you say like uh, if knowledge is a processed information, yeah. uh, then uh, then what you take about nowadays if uh, with the with the with the coming of a powerful uh, knowledge processing machines, mm. like uh, so if information is a uh, if knowledge is a process uh, is a processed information, then uh, it there are, we we have got nowadays the, the capability. Uh, of processing information automatically, no, in it's, it's automatic processing. So if it, if the information is categorized, uh, it will be categorized automatically. It will be sorted and put to make a sense, and uh, it will be knowledge to my to my understanding. What's your take on that? So this process is no more in in the in this, in. Uh, uh, without a human interaction, it can be done like uh, with uh, data uh, data analysis. If we, we we take the term data information as a synonym, then uh, it is a processed data. It will be knowledge. It will be auto. It, it will be processed automatically without a human interaction with with the machines with yeah. the, with the computers. What's your take on that? What's your 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 idea that is, it's a new kind of knowledge creation, with without uh, without personal people interaction. Thank you. I can see how one might um, automatically collect the relatively raw data. What I can't easily understand is how one could automate the analysis, um, the cooking process, because um, don't humans have to do it for their own purposes? If the machine did it, would it only be useful for other machines? I don't know. I, I, I'm really, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uncomfortable with the idea of the, but then maybe it's the same problem as with artificial intelligence. Or, um. Uh, yeah, for example, mm. just like when, when we take a simple example like please Google. Ma make it short, please. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, when, when we have Google, then uh, you, you make a queries. So Google picks up the information, mm. raw information, to, to give you some, some kind of condensed knowledge. Some, you, you ask a question, so then you'll get some answers, knowledge in that case. So it is like the machine is doing, you, you are putting a question and... So yeah, my that, problem is like that, that the process of turning information into knowledge involves making it unintelligible to humans. And I suppose I think that um, only humans are likely to be able to make it intelligible to humans. So it's a kind of translation process from the raw 
data which don't seem to have any meaning. Um, and then, um, thanks to these processes of comparison and classification and verification, something comes out which um, human beings can understand and use. Okay, I think it's okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I think there was another question, though. Yes, there was perhaps, a hand perhaps a last yeah. question here. Uh, good evening. Uh, as uh, the amount of information will grow and grow, uh, what, which sort of knowledge do you think uh, you will? <laughs> okay. As uh, the amount of information will grow and grow, uh, which sort of knowledge uh, will be the result? I mean, uh, will be confined to a very specialistic type of knowledge? Because uh, this um, amount of information should be also processed. And there are a lot, a lot of growing information, and this it seems to me that uh, confined, especially academic knowledge, to little, little field, and little and little, or not? What is uh, your idea? Yeah, I think we we need specialists, but we need generalists. I don't think that this collective process that I call for short cooking or analysis um, can take place without a whole variety of expertises and to acquire just one of them takes quite a number of years of one's life. But when all that, those processes have been completed, then there's still, I think, a role for the generalist, the person that tries to fit things together. Um, I don't think you could let the generalist loose safely on um, the raw data. So they are dependent on the specialists, but they try to make up for the collective deficiency of the specialists, um, the, the narrowness which you've just referred to. So um, we need these different kinds of people in the world of knowledge, just as we need a whole variety of uh, kinds of people and skill um, in the world as a whole. <clears throat> Is there a last remark? No. Um, thank you so much, Peter Burke, uh, for your presentation, uh, for this conversation. Thank you uh, to the public for your presence and uh, your patience uh, in the last uh, one and a half hours. Um, you know, uh, and this would be my last word, we uh, know now that we are living in the midst of an explosion, but we will survive. Uh, have a good evening. <laughs> Thank you for the researching questions. Yeah.